my pleasure to be with all of you today. And I'm very grateful to get to speak with you about what was an interesting court term. And I think it'd be useful to think about this court term in relation to just the past few years and what the court seems to be doing with um, kind of 6-3 majority that's sometimes together, but often looking for unanimity, but also suggesting among those six justices who are more uh, inclined toward a conservative view of the law, even have differences among themselves. I think in general, what we've been seeing the court do over the past few terms is start to question some of the, the conventional wisdom in a lot of different doctrines in constitutional law. But the way in which those uh, doctrines have been questioned have not necessarily been in the way in which it's portrayed that something really dramatic or apple cart upsetting is happening. Rather, I think the approach the court seems to be taking is one that's trying to assess how can or whether different constitutional law doctrines are rooted in what the court has termed in multiple different cases, text, history, and tradition. Uh, this has been a mantra that the court has invoked in the Second Amendment context involving the right to keep and bear arms. There was a big case last year about that. It's a mantra that's been invoked in the First Amendment context with regard to free speech, uh, but also with regard to prohibiting an establishment of religion. It's a mantra that's invoked with regard to separation of powers and how the different branches relate among themselves uh, with regard to federalism, how the federal government and the states relate to each other. So in every one of these areas, the court seems to be evaluating uh, what is the kind of current view of things under the precedent, under the behavior of the branches or the government conduct under review? And how does that comply with uh, not just a kind of textual analysis of well, what are the words on the page mean, not just a historical analysis in terms of, well, at this distant moment in time, what was meant to be the intent here, but also with regard to tradition of over time, does this practice that's under review now, does that comport with uh, how normally the American people have worked out these kinds of conflicts? And I think that's a helpful way to think about what the court did in many of the kind of big uh, prominent cases just in the past term. So if you look, for example, at, case, at a case like Biden versus Nebraska involving the student loan, um, the student loan forgiveness under the HEROES Act, uh, there the court looked very carefully uh, both at the text of what the HEROES Act allowed the executive branch to do in terms of student loan forgiveness, but then also compared that against how has the statute been used before? What is Congress, what did Congress think it was doing when it enacted this law? Did it really imagine that the president was given this kind of massive amount of authority? And if it wasn't really imagining that, then is it really accountable to the people to say that the executive branch can do it anyways? Uh, if you look at a case like 303 Creative involving uh, the rights of a, of a private business owner, Lori Smith, with regard to her political and religious speech, there the court really took great pains to walk through both the expansion of public accommodations law and how that has really grown dramatically over the past 50 to 60 years, but then also compared that against what it mentioned, I think, four times throughout the course of that opinion, the significance under the First Amendment of political and religious speech. And so that kind of speech is something that has, as a matter of our history and tradition, we've always set aside as kind of distinctly important to preserve self-government. Um, you can look, and then sometimes though, uh, relying on a kind of text, history, and tradition approach doesn't necessarily mean that um, everything that went before it that seems inconsistent is going to get reversed or thrown out. So like another good example of that would be this case called Groff that came out this past term involving 
the requirements to accommodate uh, religious individuals and private businesses in the workplace under Title VII. Uh, a lot of people thought that this older case from the 70s called TWA versus Hardison was going to get overruled uh, because you know, the court has definitely uh, uh, protected religious freedom very consistently over the past, I would say, 10 years or so. And they just thought, well, that that just reflexively, reflexively means that any rule that's detrimental to religion, well, they're just going to throw it out and not even think about it. Uh, but that's not what happened. Uh, what actually happened was that the court looked honestly and carefully at how that case from the 1970s has been used by private employers, has been used and understood by EEOC, and has been understood by lower courts for the past 40 years or so. And it tried to come up with some clarifying rules to better implement that precedent. That could be a way that you could also think about what might happen with this upcoming term. There's going to be a case called Loper Bright, which is going to raise uh, what is commonly referred to as Chevron deference, the question of whether or not a, a Supreme, or the Supreme Court or a federal court should give uh, deference to an administrative agency's resolution of ambiguity in a law passed by Congress. So there are certain laws that Congress passes that certain agencies are kind of more or less assigned to implement. So like the National Labor Relations Board, for example, is tasked with implementing provisions of the National Labor Relations Act, or the EPA is tasked with implementing parts of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Um, the theory of Chevron is, well, uh, since that statute is going to be administered by an agency, if there's an ambiguity about what certain terms mean in that statute, the court shouldn't do what courts normally do, which is interpret law. The court should simply just defer to however that agency understood that ambiguity in the law. That issue is going to come before the court. And the way that connects back to the text history tradition point I've been trying to lay out for you in different areas is you could see a world where maybe a lot of people think that Chevron is just going to be reversed and that'll be that. Uh, but what seems perhaps just as, if not more likely, is the court will actually come up with some clarifying rules about how to think carefully about deference. Because if you were to look at text history and tradition, what you would see is that some level of discretion inheres in lawmaking. I mean, the kind of classic example is the police officer can't pull everybody over if they're all speeding. He has to make a choice. Uh, so that's, that's some level of discretion that's always going to exist when you're interpreting and implementing a law, that's not probably a level of discretion that courts could really resolve or totally prohibit. So it's a matter of, well, how do we keep some of that discretion that's just kind of natural to enforcing a law while also making sure that courts are doing the job the constitution gives them, which is to interpret laws. Uh, so I think text history and tradition kind of is a helpful way the court's been trying to walk through these different areas of law and think about, okay, the words on the page say this, at the time this provision, either of the constitution or this statute was adopted, this is what was probably meant. And then over time, here's how things have played out. How can we all harmonize that? And I think in general, the court's trying to do that. And that's probably a good thing, um, given how divided the country is on so many different issues, but also given just how pluralistic we are and how many different practices have developed, it's probably a good thing overall for that pluralism, for courts to look at how law has been operated over time to try to come up to some kind of harmonizing position that reflects those traditions and those practices. I think in general, that's, that's probably what the court is trying to do with these different areas. I hope that's helpful. Very much. How um, a question was uh, submitted earlier. How divided is the court actually? Well, so that's a very good question because, uh, and it probably depends upon what metric you want to use to measure the answer. Um, if you were to look at where the court comes down, uh, most of the time, the decisions are not close. Most of the time, 
the decisions are not 5-4. Uh, and even before there were kind of six more conservative minded justices, uh, that was not the case. I mean, for example, one of uh, my law firm, my other hat, I worked at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, and we've represented a number of parties before the Supreme Court where the victories have been 9-0, 7-2. Uh, this is, those are not close cases. And I think what that reflects, and then even among the six that are more kind of conservative leaning, and among the three that are more progressive leaning, even among them, they have very important interpretive differences. And those differences play out in terms of, do I look at this kind of evidence? Uh, what level of generality is appropriate for me to ask this question? What role and significance do I give to precedent? Uh, these are very important differences that lead the court to divide sometimes in unexpected ways. Uh, you know, for I'll give an example in, in context involving certain issues regarding Native Americans, Justice Gorsuch tends to be with a lot of more progressive lean justices. Um, there are issues on separation of powers where the court will kind of break differently. Um, sometimes Justice Barrett has written separately uh, in, a, in the Biden versus Nebraska case, for example, to take a very different view of why the court got to the answer that it did. Uh, so I think it's almost oversimplified to kind of think of the court in those kind of strictly political divided terms. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think the justice, some justices have publicly said that the impact of the, the Dobbs leak uh, definitely impacted the collegiality of the court. And that's understandable, uh, but hopefully it's not insurmountable. This is, um, you must have been uh, reading my phone with a text message. Can you talk about the impact of the Dobbs leak within the judicial system? Um, and do you ever think there'll be resolution with that? Uh, so yes, as I, as I mentioned, I, I think it's clear that, and some justices have publicly said that the Dobbs leak impacted the internal deliberations of the court. Um, it's not a surprise that that would be true. I mean, that was a pretty dramatic thing. And, uh, you know, having someone, I, I clerk for two different federal judges and the confidences that you're asked to keep are very serious. And so I, it wouldn't surprise me that that would be, uh, that that would have a detrimental effect. I also know that you know, this can trickle down to other levels of the federal judiciary in that people are really concerned about whether they can, can we submit our addresses or our information to a court and know that it's gonna be protected in a controver controversial case? Uh, you're giving over a lot of personal information when you're involved in a lawsuit. And people who see what's happened with the court, they might have that, they might have that concern. Uh, I could imagine that could be the case. So I do think that it has, it has, has, it has had some effect. Um, and we saw also, if you look at the, the Biden versus Nebraska case, I mean, the there's a related issue of the opinions themselves, kind of not just criticizing whether the answer is right or wrong, but kind of calling almost the integrity of the court into question. And that's unfortunate. And hopefully uh, that's not something that will continue because ultimately that's not, that, that's not a route that anyone benefits from going down. Uh, and so ultimately, I think it's a good thing that the court is trying to appeal to practice, as I was saying, because if you're looking at practices, if you're looking at how the American people over time have worked out their constitutional guarantees, then you are looking at something that's not just your own preferences. You're looking at something about how the American people understand what they've agreed to in the Constitution and how they're living it out. All right. Um, can you talk more about the free, um, the coach who prayed um, and the result of it, who was fired for leading the prayers after, before the game or after the game and, and the take on that? Um, one of our fellow colleagues at AEI, Daniel Cox, just released a study that says uh, people are um, losing faith in religion and they're becoming more angry toward those who are religious today. 
Um, and that I think could be an issue that pops up more and more. So can you talk a little bit about that case and how that came down in your opinion of it? Sure, sure. That, that case is called Kennedy versus Bremerton School District and it dealt with a coach uh, who was a public uh, high school football coach who had a practice of having a brief uh, prayer at the end of games that he did uh, on the field and to, to thank God for the game, as I understand it. And this was problematic in the eyes of the school district um, because they thought that it was somehow violating the prohibition on an establishment of religion in the First Amendment in order to allow this high school football coach to pray in front of uh, high school students and other people at the at the game. Uh, there was no concern that other people were being forced to participate, for example, or that he was penalizing anybody who did participate or didn't participate. There's nothing like that. It was merely the fact that because he's a teacher and he's uh, someone who's in a position of influence among students, that simply doing that in front of them would be um, a constitutional problem. And this argument is one that ultimately the Supreme Court found to really call into question our commitment to pluralism uh, more than I think anything else. Uh, we are a diverse country. Uh, we have people who maybe call religion into question, but then we also have many religious Americans. And we learn something from each other when none of us are excluded from the public square out of kind of ephemeral fears. And I think that was a, a key feature of this opinion that the, the court recognized, again, going back to history and tradition, that while we don't want to coerce anyone into violating their conscience by being forced to engage in a religious exercise they don't agree with, that's certainly true. Uh, coercion actually requires coercion and it's not simply going to be someone on their own volition, uh, not forcing anyone to participate or punishing anybody for not participating. It's gonna require actual coercion before we can say, you can't freely express yourself or, or th give thanks to God in public. Uh, you need to, as the school district had proposed, go into this kind of private box off of the field if you want to do that kind of activity. Uh, that was a core piece of the court's opinion that uh, in a pluralistic society, the way that we kind of better understand each other and develop respect for each other is by having to actually encounter each other. And uh, that, that was an important victory for that principle and also for rooting the court's establishment clause cases more into history. Uh, and tradition and our practices where, you know, if you look across our country, we have a long, a long tradition of different communities and different individuals kind of naturally expressing um, religion as a part of their own culture. And the court is not really in a position to go around the country and assess, you know, prayer by prayer, monument by monument, uh, and just start censoring things, that that would actually, that taking that approach would actually suggest a level of hostility to religious expression that doesn't have any basis in our country, but uh, would in fact maybe further the division by saying that there's something wrong with you if you want to pray in public. Thank you. One of our um, communities of supporters is a gentleman by the name of Peter Kalis, who was the former chair of Kale Gates. And he writes an op-ed for the, I think it's the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, no disrespect to the Pittsburgh newspaper, I can't remember the title of their paper. Um, but he just talked about the affirmative action piece and decision. And he, he came down on the side of that for years we've drawn lines by skin color and that the court made the right decision on that. As we look at many of the DEI practices, diversity, equi um, equity, and inclusion, how do you see the growth of that in the decision of the Supreme Court coming together? And can you talk a little bit more about the affirmative action uh, decision that came down? 
Sure. So, I mean, an important point here is that the affirmative action cases involve uh, the Constitution, and the Constitution applies to state actors or government actors. Uh, what people do in a private capacity is not covered it's not covered by the Constitution in the sense that you have the freedom to make choices that don't necessarily subject you to a constitutional violation if the government were to make them. It's called the state action doctrine. So what happens in a private business, if there's not a <clears throat> there's not a one-to-one -one relationship in that respect. But uh, what I think there were some important guideposts that have been given out from that affirmative action which are to kind of echo a, a line that Chief Justice Roberts used in an earlier case, uh, the only way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. And that's been a very clear principle that uh, in, the chief in particular has articulated throughout a number of the cases since that was uh, parents involved uh, versus, I think, Seattle School District from maybe 2007 or so. Uh, and he's been very consistent on that over time, uh, leading up to the students for fair admission case that we just had. The other, I think, important question there, and this could have some impact in other cases, is the court went uh, very carefully through a lot of the claimed interests for this, uh, these affirmative action programs. We want to have robust diversity, and we want to have uh, empathy and respectful campus dialogue and interaction. And the court didn't discount that those were laudable aims, but it questioned whether or not it's possible for a court to actually manage and administer those goals. What would constitute robust diversity? How is a court supposed to measure whether it's sufficiently robust? Uh, how does the court sufficiently measure empathy? I mean, how, how, how are these tools that courts are really empowered to measure? And to the extent that those are that people are concerned about courts kind of going out of their province and just enacting their policy preferences, well, then you really want to be careful uh, and not just put into the hands of judges these kind of open-ended goals and allow them to police them with the force of law. Uh, rather, the court said the, these goals are imponderable. I mean, you'll never really know when they've been achieved. And I think that's an important, uh, that's an important insight uh, that could have broader applicability because if these goals are kind of constantly moving, uh, then maybe they aren't really goals that law is meant to solve because law is meant to give us a resolution. I mean, the, Courts are supposed to resolve disputes, not prolong them. And it's hard to see how you could be resolving disputes when your standards are so open-ended. That, I love that. Thank you for that. As you look to the future, how do you, what do you, what other big issues do you see the Supreme Court picking up um, next term? Right. So as I mentioned, the Loper Bright case involving Chevron, I think there's still going to be a lot of questions about the proper role of uh, the relationship of the of administrative regulatory bodies to the rest of the United States government. I mean, that is really an open question in a lot of different ways. Uh, Chevron raises the issue of deference, you know, to what extent should courts let administrative agencies resolve ambiguities and laws. But that relationship question of administrative power or just executive discretion uh, is something that is an open issue in a lot of other areas. So maybe the closest related one to Chevron is what's called the non-delegation doctrine, which is different than deference. Deference is about courts saying, we're going to let agencies resolve these ambiguities in laws. Delegation is saying, look, the Congress is supposed to have the legislative power in the United States. And the executive has the executive power. And the judiciary has the judicial power. Uh, Schoolhouse Rock wasn't wrong. And so because Schoolhouse Rock wasn't wrong, there's something off, let's say, when an administrative agency just issues a rule and says, well, it happened. 
And it kind of sounds like we're enforcing the law. It also kind of sounds like we're making the law. And it also kind of sounds like we're interpreting the law. There's definitely a uh, lack of fit, let's say, with that and the way our system typically operates. And I think the court is very interested and concerned about that. Uh, so delegation could be an issue where that comes up. Can we? Can Congress even write these broad, open-ended laws that say, well, we all agree that we want clean air, so EPA, you go figure out what clean air means. Uh, another way that this issue comes up, we saw it a lot during COVID, is the um, deference given to uh, administrative or executive experts, either in time of emergency or in time of dealing with really scientific related issues. And I don't think anyone really in general questions that some level of deference in those contexts is appropriate. I think really it's a question of degree. And I think the, the, the quest, a lot of issues were raised about, okay, uh, we understand that there are certain scientific aspects of how you would respond to a pandemic, for example, that really aren't things that the court has the tools to get into. At the same time, if you're asking us to explain, well, you were willing to open restaurants and bars, but not churches, or we have to explain whether it's safer to go to a casino as opposed to going to a movie theater. These aren't really questions that it seems like you need a PhD to answer. Uh, they also seem like questions that are more of executive discretion than they are of science. And if there are questions of executive discretion, doesn't the judiciary have some role in making sure that the executive isn't abusing his discretion? And I think that issue is very, is very live and uh, will continue to rear its, itself at the Supreme Court in, in different contexts. As a resident of the state of Illinois who escaped to Florida, I appreciate them taking those uh, decisions up and getting some clarity on the role of the executive um, and their ability to make decisions and how they do that. Um, one question that was texted in is when there's a certain element um, of our population that would like to change the constitution, throw out part of it, they, they see it just as a piece of paper, not as, um, and something that may, may, we may wanna start over with, without the roots. And there's another group that we are rooted to the constitution, it is who we are. For those who want to throw the baby out with the bathwater or change the constitution, what, how do you respond to that? And if you were to change it, what part would you change? Wow. Uh, so if there are, I think we should probably start from the perspective of, do you want to change the constitution or do you have a misunderstanding of what the constitution is? And, and you want to change that caricature of the Constitution. Um, if, you, if you like diversity, if you think that diversity is a good thing, if you like protecting minorities, and you think that protecting minorities is a good thing, if you like the idea that not one person gets to rule over everyone else, and you think that that's a good thing, then you should really love the Constitution. Because from front to back, that's what the Constitution's about. We have an electoral college to make sure that even the smallest states still have a say in how they're governed. We have a Senate and a, con and a, le and a House of Representatives to acknowledge the fact that some parts of the country, just because of geography and demography and their history, are going to think differently than individual Americans who are reacting to the latest crisis in their own area are gonna think. And the constitution looks at those different interests and responds to them by saying, yes, it doesn't pick a side, it lets everyone get involved. Uh, the judiciary has this kind of unique role in upholding things that are taken away from the majoritarian process, a recognition that we want majorities, but we also, 
recognize that majorities can fall into mob rule. And we don't want that either. And so from front to back, the Constitution is about balance. And actually, more precisely, it's about harmony. It's recognizing that in a large, diverse country, agreement is basically limited and arguments are going to largely continue. And so it's a challenge to all of us to say, do you really want to govern yourself? Do you really want to take responsibility for your life and your community? If so, then you're going to need to roll up your sleeves and get in the fray and accept the fact that sometimes you're going to win and sometimes you're going to lose. And the surest thing that we can hope for is an honest victory and a fair defeat. And that's what the Constitution is all about. And so I think we should kind of begin from the beginning and ask, like I said, do you really want to throw out the Constitution or do you want to throw out this kind of bugaboo that you've created in your mind and call the Constitution? That was a beautiful response. Love, and to quote Ashvin, loved everything you said, and I may have to make a little video, take that little splice and make it a video. That was beautiful. And if you have any plans at Thanksgiving or if you're free at Thanksgiving, can you please come and join our family? So <laughs> that, was, that was beautiful. Well done. I don't know how we're going to get any better than that. Um, with that, I'm going to just say thank you to Will. I also want to spotlight the beautiful and talented, lovely, brilliant Victoria Williams. Um, Victoria joined AEI. We literally kidnapped her from or stole her from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. She has a heart for free enterprise, the Constitution, our great country, and um, she will be joined. She's joining AEI official. She'll have her AEI email and you'll be interacting with her as much as you do with me on all things AEI. So feel free to reach out to her. Thank you, Victoria, for coming and joining us. Will, thank you for your time today. You're awesome. And I look forward to getting to know you and having you back. Keep up. Thanks very much. You're awesome. Thank you all thank very you. much. Have a good day. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.